Okay, let's have a word of prayer, everyone. Father, it's truly for your glory that we've spent so much time these last few weeks studying these various areas of science and testifying, Lord. It testifies, it preaches and screams from the, from the rooftops, from the soil, from the skies, from the heavens. It just screams that this book that we call your word truly is your word. And it's not self-declared. It's not just because the Bible says so. It's because it's proven all around us. And so, Lord, we ask for that same blessing this evening to help us this one last time. You will show us in the different things we discuss that your word is 100% accurate and trustworthy for these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, clarity in the midst of confusion. Are we living in a world that's confused? Very confused, incredibly confused. And that's the blessing of having the Word. The Word is our safeguard in these last days. It's, it's the foundation we need. It's the guidance we need, the instruction we need. And it really does not just provide clarity, but peace in these times as well. Well, how about we start one more time with a mismatched scientific animal, something that doesn't testify what they originally claimed it testified. This is the Compsognathus, and I've heard multiple different pronunciations of this animal, so if there's a paleontologist watching online or here and knows that I'm saying it wrong, I'm trying to do, I've heard so many different ways to say it, the Compsognathus, that if, I haven't seen these movies, but if you've seen Jurassic Park, these are very popular animals in the Jurassic Park universe. And they're actually as small as maybe they look on the screen. We have only found two of these fossils, only two. Around the world, over the 100 plus years that we've been finding fossils, we've only found two of them. One was one foot tall, and one was four feet tall. So it seemed to have a pretty uh, different, uh, you know, differentiation between the two. But because that one foot tall one is chicken sized, many have also said, see, it's another missing link between dinosaurs and chickens. Well, it's been taught that way for a long time, but no longer does secular science view it that way because uh, more of their DNA testing on this fossil proved that it doesn't have the genomes for feathers. That's what they originally thought. It was small. It was a dinosaur-like chicken with feathers, but it doesn't have the ability to grow feathers according to the DNA genomes. Here's what it looked like when they found that one foot tall fossil. Sorry, my computer's been freezing up on me all day long. So they found this uh, one foot tall one, and I want you to notice how it's, uh, you know, how it was, how it died. It's got that death pose that we've talked about before. It's got its neck kind of arching back. And, uh, and inside of its belly is a lizard. So it was eating and had just eaten at the time of its death, of its rapid burial. Now, of course, I want to remind you how fossils become, how bones become fossils. It took three parts of the ingredients, right? Nothing to do with millions of years. That is not according, even to secular science, that is not one of the rules in order for something to become fossilized. It does not require long amounts of time. It had to be buried in the correct environment, the right type of dirt, sand, etc. It has to be the right type of material that is buried. Bones is that, are, are the correct type of material. And it had to have a rapid burial. Correct? Remember those? The environment, what was buried, and it had to be a rapid burial. Time did not matter as long as that time was a quick rapid burial in that sediment, in that sand, in that mud, whatever the environment was, it had to be covered instantly. But when we read about this animal in the secular science world, because it doesn't have the bones that are broken, remember we've discussed often you'll find the uh, fossilized remains of dinosaurs and woolly mammoths with its legs broken, 
They'll have that death pose like they were dying quickly or dying from a rapid burial. But they'll have the broken legs as they were trying to scamper themselves out of wherever they were stuck in. This one doesn't have broken bones. And so for many decades it has been believed, or actually well over 100 years, it has been believed that this one died in a calm environment. That it died actually before it was found or where it was buried. Here's National Geographic, a book called Dinosaurs Discussing the Compsognathus. And it says, luckily for scientists, Compsognathus lived close to the shore of a calm lake. After death, the, body, the animal's body sank to the bottom of the lake and the calm waters ensured that the bones were not broken up before fossilization could begin. Does that sound like the type of the, ingre the ingredients that we need for fossilization? That it fell into a calm lake and sank calmly to the bottom and it sat there for what they say is millions of years at the bottom with the calm waters? If you have an animal that has died on the ground or in an ocean, you're going, or in, in a lake, you're going to have predators who come by, right? And they're going to clean the earth. They're going to eat it. And that's part of the reason why rapid burial is so important. You have to be able to leave it preserved the way it died. It has to die quickly, be buried quickly, because the elements are going to attack it. The sun, the wind, Storms or predators are going to eat it and rip it to pieces. So it doesn't make any sense. So when we go back and look at this, it doesn't make any sense for it to have died in a calm way, in a calm lake, sitting through the calm waters. It even has that death pose, which tells us it didn't just die outside the lake and then somehow get thrown into the lake, but it died under rapid burial. You often find this in secular science that they don't connect the dots. What might be true for this thing might be true over here and might not be true here and might not be true here. And they kind of pick and choose as they go what rules are what rules and which works here and which works there. They're pickers and choosers when it comes to the evidence. You often will find that. They'll do anything and everything they can to try to Prove that things will die without the rapid burial of the global flood. So, what would happen if the dead body sank to the bottom of a calm lake? That's not rapid burial. That's not the process of fossilization. That's just dinner for one of the other fish, right? Think about all the animals that must have roamed this earth prior to the flood. I mean, we're talking, I don't know, Millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of animals all over the world roaming this world. And yet we don't have, in that great number, we don't have a whole lot of fossils. John Pickrell, the BBC geology writer and editor, said this, less than one-tenth of one percent of all species that have ever lived became fossils. So think about all the animals that died at the flood, they did not all become fossils. It had to be very particular reasons. It had to be the right environment, the right kind of structure, and it has to include rapid burials. The only thing that makes sense, they have to die quickly, preserving their body from decom decomposing from the elements. It's incredibly rare for something to become a fossil. And so when we find these fossils, they have to then, they all teach us the same story. We don't have to pick and choose the evidence. They all actually end up teaching us the same story, that there was an event many years ago in which these animals all died under rapid burial. Sue Beardmore, a taphonomist, remember taphonomy is the study of fossils and the, and the burial of bones. Taphonomist at Oxford University Museum of Natural History says it's really a question of maintaining 
a good condition of the body after death, long enough to be buried under sediment and then altered physically and chemically deep underground to become a fossil. Can something then, according to the Tephonomist, become fossilized because it died outside a lake and then it got thrown into the calm lake and calmly drifted down to the bottom and settled there for millions of years by calm waters? That's not it. That's not, the, that's not how things become fossilized. It has to be, they have to be buried physically and chemically deep where? Underground under dirt, under sand, under mud. So the fossils we do have all prove that there was some event, not just of water, but something happened on this earth that rapidly buried animal life around the world. Where do we find fossils? Around the world. So something happened around the world that buried them under earth, under mud, under soil. So the Compsognathus did not die the way they say it died. Even though, yeah, okay, so it doesn't have broken legs. It doesn't mean it died in a calm lake and calm waters. That's not the recipe for fossilization. Do we have an event then in this book that would bury animals rapidly under dirt? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when we think about the flood, we forget about the physical uh, explosions that took place on the planet. It's not just water. It wasn't just rain. There was natural explosions coming up out of the earth. And as those explosions of all the fountains of the great deep, all that dirt, all that soil has to go somewhere. And a lot of it landed on top of these animals and beings or, or, or animal life. And there was rapid burial. Tonight, we're going to talk about plate tectonics and the rapid movement of our continents, the rapid movement of our land. Does that fit with rapid burial? You've got all this, I don't know, billions and billions of pounds of sand and dirt moving all over the world. A lot of things are going to be rapidly buried, correct? Did that happen? Genesis 7, 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, notice, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So again, it's not just rain wasn't just water from the sky, it was water from the sky and water bursting up out of the ground. Imagine the rocks, the dirt, the land that would have been blown sky high and then landing down all over the earth, rapidly burying all kinds of animals for us to find all these years later. Science is desperate, again, to show that there's any other option other than the Bible. The leading idea is, as we've discussed, the, uh, the, the comet or the asteroid that would have hit the Yucatan Peninsula, causing you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, water and things and dirt to fly around the world and to kill off all the dinosaurs we discussed a few days ago, how that they believe it could have taken up to two years for them to die. But outside of that, there are some secular scientists who agree with another idea of what caused all the dinosaurs to die off in a mass extinction, and that's constipation. <laughs> They'll believe anything and everything as long as it won't agree with this book. As flowering plants started to appear all over the world, we've talked about that, the angiosperms, they must have gone crazy and went, woo, look at all the new food. They started to eat all this green and all this, you know, all this veggies and things, and then, oh, their digestive tracts weren't ready for all those greens, and mass constipation all over the world killed off the dinosaurs. Anything but the Bible. They don't have clarity in the midst of confusion. They find these things in the earth. 
they won't agree with the Bible, and that automatically leads them to confusion. And they can't figure out what's going on. I mean, what kind of event would have caused this animal, an ichthyosaur, to fossilize that exact way? Now, if you're looking at it, you don't know what that is. There are two fins up front and a tail in the back. Those aren't four legs. What's hanging off the bottom of that ichthyosaur is that it died instantly, rapid burial, while it was giving birth. That is a baby halfway out of the birth canal. The, I was just going to say, how rapid do you think that was then? That's incredibly rapid. The fountains of the great deep exploded and much of the animal life buried instantly, but it still had to have just the right ingredients to fossilize for us to find. Science, many in science say it was an extreme climate event. Would you call a global flood an extreme climate event? Science offers no clarity in the midst of confusion, but the Bible does offer that clarity. Science does believe that sometime, not that long ago, humanity, human life, suddenly subtracted itself, suddenly divided, suddenly shrank. I know the word I'm looking for. It bottlenecked. That there was a human life, this many humans living on the world, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, human life bottlenecked. Notice this. The early ancestors of humans were reduced to 1,300 individuals and came close to extinction, scientists say. This is just uh, new research from this summer. It continues, scientists believe that an evolutionary bottleneck might have been caused by an extreme climate event, which they estimate left just 1,280 breeding individ individuals of our ancestors for about, now remember, we've talked about time. We don't have to listen to their time. They're wrong, and they guess at this. 117,000 years, the Guardian reported. So we have human life all over the planet, and then suddenly what happens? An extreme climate event. Would they say it's the same one as the dinosaurs? Oh, no, dinosaurs and humans couldn't live at the same time. They're 66 million years ago. So these are different global climate events but it caused mass extinction of animal life back then, and then another one happened, and human life bottlenecked. We don't have to trust their numbers or their dates, but is there a story in the Bible which would include all of that in one story, where animal life, suddenly, much of it was wiped off the planet, and humanity bottlenecked down from however many millions or even a billion antediluvians lived on this planet, and then it bottlenecked up? Right? In fact, we've noticed that as they came off the ark, that they stayed together. They likely traveled to Gobekli Tepe, and then they traveled as the ice age set, ice age set in. They traveled down to modern-day Iraq, and that's where the Tower of Babel story happens. And we've noticed that this includes the families of three main branches, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We were able to link that those three families are in science called... Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and Denisovans, right? They see that we all come back from three main lines of, hu of ancient humans. We just call them the families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, in the Bible story, you've got these three sets of families who now, this is 70 years later, so they're starting to procreate. There's many more than just the eight of them. And then the Tower of Babel takes place, and what happens after the Tower of Babel? They split, they separate, they move, they move, they move. And we followed their migration patterns. The family of Ham moved south to Africa. The family of Japheth moved north to Europe. And the family of Shem, many moved towards the east, including some who crossed the Bering Strait, right? Notice, they're saying some global extreme climate event took place and humanity bottlenecked. But notice what they say happened then. 
the population decline occurred about the same time human ancestors split from Neanderthals and Denisovans. Is this proving the Bible true or what? Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, you see the Bible being recorded in the historical record and the geologic record. A global climate event, the flood happened, humanity bottlenecked, they came off the ark, and then the three families after the Tower of Babel split. And that's what the geologic record, that's what the record is showing us. Humanity bottlenecked at a climate event, and then they split in those three families. Wow. So let's go back before the flood. The planet looks something a little bit more like this. We really don't have an absolute clue of what it looked like, but something like this where the continents, whatever the continents looked like, they were more like one continent. Science will call this Pangaea. So let's call it Pangaea because I don't have a better term than that. Though, as an important side note, in the story of the Bible, or in the stories of Genesis, we do have two names for land at that time. We have Eden, of course, right? The Garden of Eden. And then we have where um, Cain went, and that's called the land of Nod. Eden means pleasure. Nod means wandering. So the land of pleasure or peace and calm. The land of wandering. Do you want clarity in the midst of confusion? Live like you live in Eden. Let's go back to those Edenic values. That's something we've heard throughout our series. Let's go back to the way we were supposed to live before the entrance of sin. That's true pleasure. Amen? Following God's commandments, living in righteousness, living in holiness, living according to His plans and His instructions, that's our true pleasure. That's our peace. That's our clarity. Cain rebels, as we've learned this week, and he goes out and does everything opposite of what God says, and his land that he chooses is the land of wandering, the land of pacing, the land of stress, the land of anxiety, the land of no clarity and confusion, right? Sin is confusion. Righteousness is peace. These are the only two lands that are named from Genesis 1 through 11. Righteousness is pleasure. Sin is a life of uncertainty. But back to the physical description. Continents were likely all together at some point, because that is what the geologic record shows us. It doesn't necessarily mean millions of years ago. But prior to the flood, the continents were together. By the way, that's why we find T-Rexes around the world. That doesn't mean T-Rex got on the ark, got off the ark, migrated around the world, and then died. They died where they all lived, and then the earth split apart at the flood. The plates of the earth drifted apart during the storms and the climactic events of the flood. And we can find T-Rexes or different animals on different continents in fossilized parts. So science will tell you, Pangaea on the left, things kind of fit together. Have you ever noticed that our continents kind of fit together like a puzzle? Not perfectly, of course. A lot of damage has been done over the years, but they kind of fit together. And then we, at some point, secular science says, over hundreds of millions of years, we've drifted apart to where we are today. Now, what was the purpose of the flood? What did we learn? The purpose of the flood was to slow the spread of, skin, of sin, right? To slow the spread of sin. This is why God drifted the continents apart to distance people from one another, to slow things down, to slow the spread of sin. Which means plate tectonics was a blessing for us. The continental drift is a blessing to humanity, but because of the events of the past, the fact that we are so spread out now, and the event of Tower of Babel, that we have different languages, God was then going to have to give us a gift to help us finish the work, because the work is spreading the gospel to the world, right? Now, you might know that our planet's crust, whether we're talking about continental crust or the crust under the ocean, it's all broken into plates, and those plates are actually moving. 
This is what causes earthquakes, right? When, when plates get stuck and they can spring out or they can cause commotion that causes the earthquakes. And of course, around the ring of fire in the Pacific, there's a lot of plate movement. And so you get a lot more volcanic activity and earthquake activity. Science will say that it was over hundreds of millions of years. Why? Because of the law of uniformity that we've noticed Peter warns us about, right? Remember that prophecy says in the last days, people will think that the things remain the same as they always have been. The law of uniformity. So we know that the continental plates are shifting and moving at just a few centimeters a year. An average of five centimeters a year. Well, that's the speed they are moving today. So science says hundreds of millions of years ago, billion years ago, they were moving the same speed because of the law of uniformity. So they measure how much they're moving today. Well, if we've moved to that much, it must have taken billions of years or hundreds of millions of years for us to move. Unless, of course, there was an event that happened that would have caused things to move a whole lot faster. Hmm. The movement of the plates is called subduction. The thinner of the plates will move underneath. As the plates collide, the one that's lighter, the one that's thinner, is going to move underneath and break apart as it comes down towards the hotter core of the earth, right? And then that, that heat, that lava, that, I'm sorry, that, well, it turns into magma, that, that crust that melts has to move somewhere and it comes out of the earth as, as, as magma from volcanoes. Only a few centimeters a year. But if we have the fountains of the great deep all opening up, you know, the groundwater plays an important role in keeping our core at a fairly temperate level. I mean, it's still really hot, but not one that spikes or cools down. If you've got that water, it keeps it at a specific level. If you suddenly take all that water out, all that cooling that it does, what's going to happen? Things are going to heat up drastically. If you suddenly, within minutes, pull all that water out, things are going to drastically heat up. And all that stuff will move so much faster if it's hotter down there under the earth. And so while science says, secular science, excuse me, secular science says few centimeters a year for the last several hundreds of millions of years, young earth creationists can say, well, certainly fine, that's what it's moving at now. But during the flood, it would have moved what we call rapid subduction rapid movement of the plates. I'm sorry, runaway subduction is what it's called. And we suppose that it would have moved several feet per second. All those plates before were not moving. And then suddenly they all start exploding. All that water is emptied. And they're going to start moving several feet per second. And then you can have, in the time of the flood, all those continents break apart, shift apart, and move around the world where they have, because some of that water, much of that water has soaked back into the earth, what happened to the, the core? Cooled back down, and so what happened to the plate movement? Slowed back down. It's slowing back down over time, right? Some of you ha may have been there, got Old Faithful. Old Faithful, and what do we have here? Hot water bursting up out of the earth, right? Very hot water bursting up out of the earth. But imagine now, that's just one geyser. All the water under the earth exploded out all at once. So you have a really hot core. All those plates are moving at supersonic speed, several feet per second, it all actually works along the creationist idea, the creationist teaching that it's a young earth and all that continental drift happened within the year to year and a half of the time that the floodwaters prevailed along the earth. But there's a reason, there's a bigger reason actually why I want to study this and discuss this. It's not just so much the plate tectonics, it's what the geologic record shows us the world was like before plate tectonics. 
Secular science will say a billion years ago, long before plate tectonics started, uh, the plate started to move, there was a time period when there were no plate tectonics. The plates, there were no plates. The earth was not fractured. Everything settled nicely. And in fact, you'll see that these, this straight line across, there is a, this is secular science now, a billion year period where everything was perfect on the earth. That all the natural cataclysms that we have, the terrible weather patterns, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, the extreme temperatures, the extreme heat, the extreme cold around the world, all of that is caused by plate tectonics. And there was a time in this earth, on this earth, before the plate started to move, that everything was perfect. Secular science calls this the boring billion. The temperature around the world was stable. Same kind of temperate, beautiful weather everywhere on the planet. There were no storms at that time. CO2 levels were a lot higher, but stable. No tectonic plate movement, no volcanoes, no earthquakes. And that line, again, is the temperature in the tropics never moved. In other words... The geologic record says that before whatever the event was that caused the plates to start moving, the world was perfect. Does this also testify that this book is true? How much more evidence do we need? Because before the flood, the world was made perfect. This is the end of creation, Genesis 1.31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. God made it perfect. No, it wasn't a billion years long. It was about 1,500 years, in fact, 1,500 years from creation to the flood. 1,500 years, the world was perfect. The people weren't. Society wasn't. We're talking about the plan, planet. It was perfect in the way God had made it. What has caused everything we suffer from now in the natural world? The flood results are still happening. And one of those results are the plates moving under the earth. It caused a lot of trouble for this world. It has put the world on a timeline to destruction. Which, hey, is good news if we believe in the word because it says a new earth will be made for us. Amen? So when they came out of the ark, they really did come out into a whole new world. And we've talked about the harsh environments, the harsh realities. This is why society, science, culture does a massive reset, right? This is why the record shows that they were used primitive tools. And all they had no idea how to live on a world like this. It was a whole different world before the flood. This was all new to them. They had to come up with things that they never had to think about before. They never dealt with heavy winds and extreme heat or extreme cold. They probably never needed jackets or air conditioners, right? Pastor Phil, if they were technologically advanced, why don't we find their air conditioners under the earth? They didn't need them. They had a whole different world. Everything was cared for them by the planet. They came out, even as they, em as they emptied the ark, what did they see? A mountain range like they'd never seen before. Jagged cliffs, canyons and valleys. They'd never seen this kind of thing before. They came out into a whole new world, broken apart. Land all around the world. And as we've noticed in this series, that's why God would spread people out after the Tower of Babel because he made the promise. Moses writes that the world was full of people. And now that we came and we explored the world and we find people on islands all through the Pacific and we find indigenous people in the Americas and all over the world, we're like, wow, God was truly honest. People lived all over the world after the Tower of Babel. Let's catch this verse. Genesis 10, 25. This is the genealogies of, uh, of, of Noah's family. Two Eber were born, two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days, the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. I have noticed that there are a lot of young earth creationists who point to this verse and they say, See, Moses knew about continental drift. The earth was divided. 
However, I don't quite buy that. I think this is speaking about the next time that we're, the next story that we're going to discuss when the earth was divided socially. Just imagine now if it happened, Peleg is about 50 to 70 years after the flood. Imagine if people are now populating the earth and are starting to, you know, procreate and grow homes and, I mean, build homes and grow farms. All of a sudden, the earth starts moving several feet per second. You think that happened? No, 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 no. The continental drift took place during the flood. What happened then that caused the earth to be divided? Peleg was the descendant of Noah alive at the time of the Tower of Babel. He was the great, great, great grandson of Noah, and he lived, or, you know, roughly, uh, he, he was born about 70 years after the flood. Let's keep reading. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these, the nations, not the earth, not the dirt, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So the earth was divided, the physical planet was divided during the flood, but the nations, the people, were divided after the flood, after the Tower of, ba of Babel. This is runaway subduction of cultures, right? They quickly migrated out around the world as God had purposed them. So if that's the final story of Genesis where all the world shares the same information, and if we have tested these stories, we have found Garden of Eden stories around the world. We have found Adam and Eve type stories around the world. We have found creation stories from around the world. We have found feathered serpent stories from around the world. We have discovered flood stories from around the world. What then should we find when we look at Tower of Babel stories? Stories similar to that all around the world. Proving yet again, Genesis 1 to 11 is our shared history. No matter our ethnicity, our people group, it's our story right there. So let's notice this. In case someone doesn't know the story of the Tower of Babel, let's catch some verses about it. Genesis 11, 1 and 2. Now the earth, now the whole earth, had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. And they, that's, that's the people, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God had sent a flood. Humanity bottlenecked. And God told Noah what? Populate the earth, right? Spread out over the earth. People came off the ark. A few generations later, many of them not following God's ways. God says, spread out. What do they do? Let's stay huddled together. Let's stay huddled together. God said, I won't flood the world again by another, by another you know, global flood. And what do they do? Let's build a tower to protect ourselves, save ourselves. And let's go study the sky. Why did all those things happen? Let's go study the sky. This was secular scientists in ancient times. There's no God. There was no God who caused the global flood. Let's find out why it naturally took place. They were denying the promise of God. God had just reset the earth to slow the spread of sin, and they were living for open rebellion against him yet again. The nature of mankind. So they built the tower as a sign that they were rejecting God and what? They lived in confusion. Why the flood? Will it flood again? Is there a God up there? Since there is no God, what do we do? How do we protect ourselves? They were living in confusion. And so God came down and confounded their language. He split them into people groups based on language because it was a symbolic gesture. They were already living in confusion. Let them be confused. They are now going to babble to each other. They won't be able to understand each other because of the various languages that God created. All languages in the world, by the way, we can trace back to 68 or 
to 75 languages. So that's probably how many languages God created there on the spot at the Tower of Babel. You can trace them all back to about 70 nations at the time. I want you to know that it's perfectly okay to have a tower in these times of confusion. Not the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Confusion, but a Tower of Peace. You know, it is okay to have a tower. Notice how we should have our tower. Proverbs 18.10 The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Amen? We can have, if we follow this word, we can have our clarity in the midst of of confusion. We can have that peace if we run to Jesus. How different would history be if Adam and Eve had done such a thing, right? And listen, it was just two people, so don't count yourself out. What's the big deal if I don't today? You never know what your rebellion or my rebellion can cause on a global scale. Just think about what's happening right now in Israel, right? What's happening in Israel? You've got two people claiming to have the right to the land. And you could make an argument for both. But why could you make an argument for both? Because Abraham sinned, right? Because of one sin, one time sleeping outside his marriage, one act of adultery, and look, thousands of years later, we have innocent children being slaughtered on the street. So don't ever think one sin's okay. This little bit's okay. You never know the act of one sin on your descendants and the generations to come. Run to the Lord, our strong tower. Flee to him in times of temptation. Psalm says this, Psalms 20 verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Run to Jesus. Don't trust in the things of this world. Don't trust on a politi- in a tr- political party. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm saying don't trust that they can fix this world. One name can fix this world. One name can cause revival. One book records how we can do it. It's right here Jesus Christ, the Word. So let's notice Genesis 11, 5 and 6. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So he comes up with a plan. Come. Come. Let us, we talked about the Godhead already, notice they're present again. Let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad all over the face of all the earth. So, key parts. People uniting together under one language, rebelling against God, God destroying their tower, taking their tower from them, confusing their languages, and spreading out over the world. Those are the ingredients of the story of the Tower of Babel. And if it's true, we're going to find those ingredients in cultures all over the world. The world. We can start in Mexico. We're going to go around the world and we'll end back in Mexico. According to the Dominican friar, Diego Duran, he was told the story by an ancient Aztec elder that the pyramid of Cholula, of Cholula, which you see here, which by the way is larger than the pyramid of Giza in volume, was built by an ancient race of giants. They searched the world for the gods of the sun. And when they couldn't find gods here on the planet, they decided to build a massive pyramid into the sky to see if they could challenge the gods up 
in the sky. That angered their God who scattered the giants around the world and demolished their tower to just the remnants we see today. Come here to Arizona, the Tohono O'odham Nation. They have a story about Montezuma, not the Aztec ruler, but their god was named Montezuma, who helped them escape a great flood. Then, after the flood, they still chose to be wicked, and they attempted to build a house, reaching into the heavens to challenge the Great Spirit. When the Great Spirit saw them building this house into the heavens, he destroyed it with thunder from heaven, and they ran from him by scattering around the world. We can go to the Sumerians. They have the story of Enmerkar and their lord of Arata. Their story is that Enmerkar decided to build a large ziggurat building, and he asks the gods, we talked about the Anunnaki uh, the other night, he asked the gods of the Anunnaki to disrupt the languages of the people. There were too many people in the ziggurat, too many people lived there, and he wanted to get rid of some of the people, and so we asked the gods, confuse their languages, and they will spread out away from here. The gods agreed, and so they scattered the people by confusing their languages, and only this ziggurat was left there in uh, Sumeria, which of course would be the land of Babylon. The Greeks and the Romans actually share the exact same story, like much of their stories and their legends. They just replace the names, right, from the Greek gods to the Roman gods. Uh, the Roman poet Ovid is probably the most well-known. They share the story that the Titans, remember those are the giants in, in the land, according to the Greeks, the Titans stacked mountains on top of one another trying to study the house of the gods up in the heavens. When the supreme god sought Zeus in, in one, you know, one and Jupiter in the other, when the supreme god saw them stacking it, he demolished them by lightning from heaven, and they all fled to the world around them. We can go to Africa, where we have a story uh, from a tribe in Botswana near, near Lake Ngami. A doctor you may have heard of, heard this story from their elders, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. And he writes this story down, that, there, that they had a large tower that they built into the heavens, but at the end of that story, the gods are angered by them building the tower, and they cause the building to collapse, and the people get scared, and guess what they do? Scatter over the rest of the world. The Lozi people of Zimbabwe teach a story of wicked men who built a tower of masts to pursue the creator god in Nyambe. They wanted to study more about the creator god. When he discovered what they were doing, he caused the tower to fall. Many people perished, and then the people who were scared of him spread and ran away around the earth. You can move to the Karen people of Burma, Indochina. Their ancestors are said to have migrated to that area after they abandoned a great pagoda that was built into the heavens by a people rebelling against God. And when God heard their rebellion, he changed their languages, confused their languages, and people scattered around the world. We can even go into the South Pacific, the Admiralty Islands just north of New Guinea. They tell the ancient story how all of mankind spoke one language at one time, but when they attempted to build houses reaching into the heavens, the gods punished them by changing the languages into multiple languages and people scattered around the world. Are you getting bored? Are you hearing the same story over and over? Same story over everywhere you go. Then we'll come full circle back to Mexico. Fernando de Alva Cortes, a historian of the Toltecs, which are a people who lived in Mexico before the Aztecs. The Toltecs have a story of a great global flood. 
and only a few people survived. After the flood, the people united in fear of the gods and decided to build a high tower in case a second flood came. This lack of faith angered the gods, and so the gods confused the people's languages and commanded them to spread out around the world. And there's so many more. The Congo people, the Ashanti tribe, the Kuki people, the Karbi tribe, the Tharu of Nepal. Around the world you find similar stories over and over and over again of a Tower of Babel type event. Wow. The Bible is proven true again and again and again. We've taken more, we've had 16 lessons, but we've had multiple Lessons in each lesson. We've seen dozens of different ways to prove the word true. Amen? Amen. We have grown in God's, in the knowledge that we need of God's word. And we have that safeguard that we need for the last days. We have no excuse then, family. No excuse to not be on the streets of gold someday. No excuse. We know our Lord Jesus Christ. We have faith in his word. And we have everything. We need all the tangible evidence. Not just a blind faith, but a tangible, real evidence to know this book knows what it's talking about. Follow it, and you'll be walking behind the lamb, following the lamb wherever he goes. Now, of course, just give me just a few more minutes. We're getting about our 50th minute or so. They created a problem. Sure, God showed his grace and mercy in that he gave us beautiful languages and beautiful cultures and beautiful nations, right? People who could spread out and fill the world. But now they're going to speak all kinds of different languages. And so they're going to spread out. And God knows that over time, oral history is going to change. They're going to lose sight of him. But he raised up a people in Israel. And then he raised up the New Testament church to have a job, to be the light to the Gentiles. So how do we take the gospel to cultures we don't understand? How do we take the gospel to languages we don't speak? Well, this was simple. He could fix it. When the Holy Spirit was given to the church at the day of Pentecost, what did they speak? They spoke in tongues. Did they babble like the people at Babylon and Tower of Babel? Or did they speak clarity in the midst of confusion? Were people confused? Notice this, Acts chapter 2. Speaking of the disciples, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then they were all, now this is the crowd, then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Let's keep reading. This is Acts 2, 4 and 7 through 11. How is it that we hear each in our own what? Language. Was it just random babbling? No, they heard it in their personal language. How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. They were granted clarity in the midst of confusion. They all came to hear of this Jesus who had been, who had been killed but raised from the dead. And they came to the upper room. All these vast different cultures, they all came to hear. But the disciples, on their own, couldn't get the truth to them if they all spoke various languages. But they spoke with an inspired tongue, just as the authors of the Bible wrote with an inspired pen. Amen? They spoke in a way. And that, including if you add like places like Asia, I mean, there's all kinds. This is more than 12. So how did 12 disciples speak more than 12 languages? That's why tongues has to also have a translator. And who's the translator? 
the person hearing it in their language. And so the disciples could speak, but regardless of who the person was, they could hear it in a language of their own. There's a story of an Adventist evangelist in Mexico who went, they traveled to Mexico. He had a powerful, wonderful translator. He, they just, they were bonding and clicking and he was preaching powerful sermons. There were hundreds of people coming to these meetings and every night, over and over, he would just present these powerful messages to, to a vast crowd who weren't Adventists. But one night there's this horrible rainstorm. And the evangelist is like, oh, no, no one will come. They're going to stay home. But, of course, people came out anyway. But as he looked around, there was one person not there. He would got stuck in the mud somewhere and didn't make it that night. The translator did not make it. And so the evangelist got to his knees and said, Lord, I'm going to need the gift of tongues. I'm going to need to speak in Spanish tonight. I don't know how. I know a few words. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need the Holy Spirit. And he got off his knees and, and he tells the story, I was absolutely certain when I got on that stage, Spanish would come out of my mouth. And he gets up on the stage and he starts and he begins to preach and his heart breaks as he hears English coming out of his mouth. But he just decides, oh, I'm going to keep preaching anyway. And he preaches, he tries to keep his energy, he tries to be excited, but he's just heartbroken. But he's noticing that people keep shaking their head. <laughs> and people keep going, amen, amen. So he keeps preaching, keeps preaching. And by the end of the sermon, he gets up and he sees one of the elders and he says, sir, I'm so sorry, I, I tried, I prayed for the gift of tongues. But, and the elder said, sir, that was some of the greatest Spanish I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> to fix the confusion of Babel, God gave us the gift of tongues to preach the gospel. And sometimes you may hear a language coming out of your mouth, but the person's hearing it in their own language. And it's not, you can even be speaking English. Sometimes we're like, I'm not good enough, I'm not talented enough, I could never preach, I could never teach, I'm too nervous, I can't share the gospel. You never know what you're going to share that someone needed to hear. You might be nervous and anxious. There are times, there are times when, when I preach a sermon and I'm, I'm patting myself on the back afterwards like, oh, that was good, that's exactly how I wanted it, it worked great. And then the crowd is quiet and doesn't do much and they leave. And then there's times I'm like, oh, that was a horrible sermon. It didn't work the way I wanted. And then afterwards, people are like, that was great. I needed to hear that. I was, I was dealing with just that thing this week. And I don't know. God knows, though. God knows what people need to hear. Never discount yourself. Never think you're not good enough, talented enough. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of God. Let people know the truth. The Spirit will give us the words to say just as he gave the prophets the words to write. Acts 2, 44 through 47. This is the result of the gift of tongues. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Wow, what a church. A true apostolic church who shared all their wealth and shared all their possessions for the work of, the God, of, of God's work. Amazing. So continually, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Wow. When we walk in clarity in the midst of confusion, when we go out with a purpose every single day to share the gospel with people, things happen. Who knew that God can finish the work that he started? And he can counter the work at Babel. He created beautiful languages, but with the gift of the Holy Spirit, he can finish the work through us. Our last verse of our series, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. 
for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. I hope as you've come, that's what you've heard and what you've experienced and what you are convicted is 100% truth now. It's no longer faith anymore, it's knowledge now. We know that our God is a God of truth. We know this book is accurate. We know we are safe to follow it. And we know that our Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we conclude our series, but don't stop your work. Continue to convict us. Continue to share with us. Continue to help us mature and grow. Lord, we see a work that needs to be done. The apostolic church needs a revival. We need to be active daily, working from place to place, going from place to place, always with the mission to share the word. Lord, we don't know what we need to say, who we need to say it to, but we ask for the gift of tongues that you will know what to say, who to speak to, when to speak to them, so we can see people saved daily. Help us finish the work, Lord, of proclaiming your truth to the world that we might go home to be with you forever. In Jesus' precious name, amen.